when we uh, settled on the title for this talk some time ago, a uh, few would have guessed how apt it would be uh, when the time came, uh, that is how dramatically the world would be changing and how far reaching are the uh, implications and consequences for domestic and world order. Uh, the democracy uprising in the Arab world uh, has been a spectacular display of uh, courage, uh, dedication, and commitment to, uh, by popular forces. Uh, it uh, coincided fortuitously uh, with a remarkable uprising, also unexpected, uh, of tens of thousands of people in uh, support of working people and democracy in uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin and uh, other U.S. cities. In fact, one telling event occurred on February 20th when Kamal Abbas uh, sent a message from Tahrir Square in Cairo to Wisconsin workers saying, we stand with you as you stood with us. Uh, Abbas is uh, a leading figure in the, uh, has been in the many years of struggle uh, of Egyptian workers for uh, elementary rights. What's happened since January 21st, did, 5th did not come out of nowhere. In fact, the uh, uh, April 6th movement, which organized it, the movement of young people, tech-savvy young people, that took its name April 6th from a, a, a major strike action, a support action in the uh, uh, big industrial center, textile industrial center of uh, Egypt Mahala Center a couple of years ago. Now, that was crushed by force, but it was April 6th, and that gives the name for the movement that erupted unexpectedly even to the organizers on January 25th. Uh, he, uh, uh, Abbas's message of solidarity uh, evoked uh, the traditional uh, aspiration of uh, labor movements worldwide for uh, solidarity among the workers of the world and among populations generally. Well, however uh, flawed their record, uh, labor movements have regularly been in the forefront of popular struggles for uh, both basic rights, uh, including labor rights and uh, democracy generally. Uh, in Tahrir Square, in the streets of Madison, and many other places, the popular struggles underway right now uh, reach quite directly to the prospects for authentic democracy. Uh, that means socio-political systems in which uh, people are free and equal participants uh, in controlling the institutions in which they live and work. And I stress participants and not mere spectators. Uh, that's the way democratic theory uh, has insisted uh, is their function, as it's called, the function of the public, uh, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, to quote uh, Walter Lippmann, the most prominent 20th century uh, American public intellectual, uh, Wilson Roosevelt progressive. Uh, these are in his uh, highly regarded uh, progressive uh, essays on democracy, and he was articulating a standard view, which actually traces back to the founders of the U.S. Constitution and is upheld, of course, in much harsher forms elsewhere. Uh, right now, the trajectories in Cairo and Madison are intersecting in a way, but they're headed in opposite directions. In Cairo, they're headed towards eliminating uh, towards gaining uh, basic rights uh, that had been denied by the Western-backed dictatorships. Uh, in Madison, they're heading towards uh, trying to defend uh, rights that had been won in long and hard struggles and are now under serious attack. Uh, there are sure to be far-ranging consequences of what's taking place, uh, both in uh, the decaying industrial heartland of the richest and most powerful country in the world, uh, in human history, in fact, and in what uh, President Eisenhower called the most strategically important area of the world, a stupendous source of strategic power, uh, 
and probably the richest economic prize in the world in the, in the field of foreign investment. Now, those are the words of the State Department in the 1940s. That was a prize, of course, that the US intended to keep for itself and for its allies in the unfolding uh, new world order that was emerging from the ruins of the Second World War. Uh, the, uh, there have been plenty of changes since, but despite, despite all these dramatic changes, there's every reason to suspect, suppose, that today's policymakers basically adopt the same perspective. Uh, they undoubtedly still adhere to the judgment of uh, uh, one of the most more influential uh, advisors of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, A.A. Burley, uh, in his words, that control of the incomparable energy reserves of the Middle East would yield substantial control of the world, and correspondingly, uh, loss of control would threaten the project of global dominance that was uh, clearly articulated during World War II by high-level planners and that has been sustained uh, in the face of uh, major changes in world order uh, uh, since that day. Uh, these common understanding is, as is quite often the case, articulated most uh, frankly and clearly in the business press in the US and the Wall Street Journal where their leading political correspondent, Gerald Seib, uh, uh, commented a couple of days ago that there's a big problem in the Middle East. We have not yet learned how to control the new forces that are emerging. Uh, the assumption is, well, of course, we have to control them. That's our right and our duty, but we have to learn how. Uh, from the uh, outset of the war, Second World War in 1939, uh, Washington anticipated that, it, that the war would end with the United States in a position of overwhelming power. Uh, High-level State Department officials and uh, non-governmental foreign uh, policy specialists uh, met regularly through the uh, wartime years. Uh, they laid out plans for the post-war world. Uh, they delineated what they called a grand area that the U.S. was to dominate. Uh, the grand area was to include at least the Western Hemisphere, uh, the entire Far East, and the uh, British Empire, which the U.S. was planning to take over, uh, including the U.S. Uh, uh, Middle East energy resources. Uh, the British Foreign Office was aware of this. If you look at their documents, not very happy about it, but they said <laughs> we're going to have to recognize that we're going to be a junior partner, as they called it, in the evolving wor world order. Uh, the, uh, well, that was in the early years of the, of the war. As uh, Russian forces started to grind down the Nazi armies after Stalingrad, uh, the conception of the grand area was enlarged to include as much of Eurasia as possible, including certainly the uh, industrial and commercial center, the heartland of uh, uh, Western Europe. Now, within the grand area, I'm now quoting, within the grand area, the US was to maintain unquestioned power with military and economic supremacy while ensuring the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by states that might interfere with its global designs. That's a live policy right now. I'll come back to crucial instances. One should bear in mind how venerable the doctrine is and how appropriate to the nature of the world that was in fact emerging. You have to remember that when the Second World War ended, the US literally had half the world's wealth, a position of power, of security that was totally unparalleled. Uh, nothing like it in history, and that was understood. It's quite clear from the documentary record, I'm quoting now, that President Roosevelt was aiming at United States hegemony in the post-war world. That's quoting the British diplomatic historian Jeffrey Warner, quite an accurate assessment. And more significant, the careful wartime plans were uh, implemented uh, uh, in very much the terms uh, in which they were outlined during the war. They were implemented shortly after. 
Well, it was always recognized from the beginning that uh, Europe might choose to follow an independent path. Uh, NATO was partially intended to counter this threat. And uh, rather strikingly, as soon as the official pretext for NATO, you know, protecting Europe from the Russian hordes, as soon as that dissolved in uh, 1989, uh, reflexively, NATO was expanded. If anyone had believed the propaganda, it should have disappeared. Instead, it expanded. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened in 1989 is a lot of clouds lifted. And you could sort of see policy less concealed by ideology. So NATO was expanded to the east. Now, that was in violation of uh, verbal pledges to Gorbachev, which he was naive enough to believe. Uh, he was pretty irritated by it, but nothing he could do. And it's uh, since been expanded beyond. Uh, now it's a US-run global intervention force. And it has an official task. The official task is controlling the crucial infrastructure of the global energy system. That's quite an expansive role. And uh, that's what NATO is now committed to. Uh, the Grand Area Doctrine uh, limits uh, the sovereignty of others explicitly, but it grants the United States uh, unrestricted rights. That's what it means to be a global hegemon. And that was made very clear and explicit at once. Uh, for example, in 1946, uh, when the US uh, agreed to uh, world court jurisdiction, but with a condition. The condition was that the United States would not be subject to any international treaties, meaning the UN Charter, the Charter of the Organization of American States, uh, uh, later the Genocide Convention, and so on. Uh, that, uh, uh, th this has come up before the court repeatedly, and the court has accepted, and as it was required to do, the reservation that uh, none of these uh, treaties apply to the United States. Uh, the uh, principles also clearly license uh, military intervention at will. And that conclusion has been clearly not, not only implemented con continuously, but also pretty clearly articulated. And one tends to think of uh, the right-wing administrations, but that's misleading. Uh, one of the most expansive uh, f forms of the doctrine was under Clinton, in fact, Bill Clinton. The Clinton administration declared, quote, that the United States has the right to use military force unilaterally to ensure uninhibited access to key markets, energy supplies, and strategic resources, and must maintain military forces forward deployed in Europe and Asia in order to shape people's opinions about us and to shape events that will affect our livelihood and our security. That's actually much more expansive than the uh, much maligned uh, George W. Bush doctrine that came later. Uh, uh, the Clinton doctrine doesn't even require the pretexts that the Bush doctrine insisted on. But it was presented politely, so therefore didn't uh, arouse much uh, interest. Actually, the, the, the antagonism towards Bush was almost entirely style, not substance. The substance is pretty standard. Uh, the, uh, I think that's one of the reasons Obama was so welcomed in Europe. The style changed, not the substance. But, uh, uh, the same principles uh, uh, governed the invasion of Iraq. Uh, that became clearer as uh, uh, U.S. failure to uh, impose its, uh, its will became uh, clearer at that, as that proceeded. The actual goals of the invasion couldn't be concealed any longer behind uh, pretty rhetoric about you know, democracy and all sorts of nice things. Uh, in November 2007, the White House issued what it called a Declaration of Principles Concerning Iraq. Uh, two main points. One was that US forces must remain indefinitely in Iraq big military bases, right to carry out combat operations. And uh, secondly, that Iraq must privilege US investors. Uh, two months later, January 2008, uh, President Bush 
uh, informed Congress that he would reject legislation that might limit the permanent stationing of U.S. armed forces in Iraq or U.S. control of the oil resources of Iraq, I'm quoting. Uh, the, uh, uh, these are demands, incidentally, that the United States had to abandon shortly after in the face of Iraqi resistance as it had been forced to back off step by step all the way through. That's a major triumph of nonviolent resistance. Uh, the U.S. and Britain have no trouble at all killing insurgents. They're very good at killing people. But they couldn't deal with the mass nonviolent resistance, the hundreds of thousands of people uh, demonstrating and protesting. So they had to back off. And finally, the basic war aims were abandoned, articulated pretty clearly as they were being abandoned. Uh, that's uh, a major defeat, as uh, Jonathan Steele and other serious analysts have recognized. Uh, in uh, Tunisia and Egypt today, the popular uprising has uh, scored quite impressive victories. But uh, as the Carnegie Endowment reported a few days ago, its research group, uh, while names have changed, the uh, regimes remain. Uh, the, uh, as they point out, a change in ruling elites and the system of governance is still a distant goal. Maybe it'll be achieved, maybe not, but it's not going to be easy. Uh, the report uh, discusses a variety of internal barriers to such changes to democracy, but it ignores, as usual, the external barriers, uh, which, as always, are quite significant. Uh, the United States and its Western allies are sure to do whatever they can to prevent authentic democracy in the Arab world. And the very simple reasons for that, uh, to understand why, it's only necessary to look at the studies of Arab opinion, which are conducted by um, uh, the most prestigious US polling agencies, uh, released by major institutions like the Brookings Institution. Uh, they reveal that by overwhelming majorities, uh, Arabs regard the U.S. and Israel as the major threats they face. Uh, the United St in Egypt, uh, the United States is regarded as the major threat by 90% of Egyptians. Uh, in the region generally, not much less than that. Uh, some regard Iran as a threat, 10%. Uh, opposition to U.S. policy is so strong that a majority uh, believe that the region would be, that security would be improved for the region if Iran had nuclear weapons. In Egypt, that's uh, 80%. Uh, other figures are similar. Uh, if public opinion were to influence policy, uh, the United States would not only not control the region, but it would be expelled from it, uh, Britain as well, uh, along with its allies. Now, that would undermine fundamental principles of uh, global domination that have been operative in their current form since the Second World War and as far as Britain's concerned back long before that. Uh, in general, um, support for democracy is the province of ideologists and propagandists. Uh, in the real world, as the more serious scholarship has conceded, the US and its allies support democracy if and only if it corresponds to strategic and economic objectives. Actually, Stalin could have said the same thing. Uh, uh, elite contempt for democracy was revealed very dramatically in the uh, reaction to the recent uh, WikiLeaks exposures. Uh, the ones that received the most attention with uh, euphoric commentary uh, were the cables that reported uh, that Arabs support the U.S. stand on Iran, really important. Now, the reference was reflexively to the ruling dictators. Now, the attitudes of the public were unmentioned. Uh, the uh, guiding principle behind this, apart from the obvious contempt for democracy on the part of the general intellectual community, uh, the guiding principle was articulated quite clearly by a Carnegie Endowment Middle East specialist, Marwan Washer, he's formerly a high official of the Jordanian dictatorship. Uh, the principle is there's nothing wrong 
everything is under control. Uh, in short, as long as the dictators support us, uh, what else could matter? Uh, the Muashar doctrine is uh, rational and venerable. Uh, to mention just one case that's highly relevant today, and my opinion ought to be in the front pages, uh, in 1958, uh, President Eisenhower expressed an internal discussion since declassified. Uh, uh, he uh, expressed a concern about what he called the campaign of hatred against us uh, in the Arab world, uh, not by governments, but by the people. Uh, the National Security Council explained at the same time uh, the reasons for it. This is the highest planning body. Uh, they said there's a perception in the Arab world that the United States supports uh, dictatorships and blocks democracy and development. Uh, and that uh, we do that so as to ensure control over uh, the resources of the region. And furthermore, they went on to say that the perception is basically accurate and uh, that that's exactly what we should be doing, relying on the Muashar doctrine. As long as people are quiet, everything's under control, it's fine. Uh, the, uh, after 9-11, uh, there were internal government studies, US government studies, uh, which confirmed uh, that the same is true. They uh, responded to George W. Bush's plaintive uh, plea that they hate our freedoms. And they concluded that, no, they don't hate our freedoms. Uh, they hate our policies, and with good reason, the same reason they did in the 1950s. Actually, 1958 was a particularly interesting moment because that was just two years after uh, Eisenhower had expelled uh, Britain France and Israel from Egyptian territory, and not incidentally because he disapproved of the invasion, thought that was okay, uh, but the timing was bad. It interfered with a US planned coup in Syria, and he didn't like the disobedience. Uh, Britain, France, and Israel are supposed to understand who's boss, and not to carry out operations like this without informing the master. So they were summarily expelled. And you might have guessed that our public opinion would be favorable to the US after this, but uh, they perceive things a little more deeply than Western ideologists. So yes, there was a campaign of hatred for the reasons that the NSC, National Security Council, uh, articulated. Uh, the current polls, which I mentioned, indicate that how little uh, anything has changed in this regard, not at all, in fact. Well, it's, uh, if we look back a little farther to history, there are some lessons there, too. It's quite normal for the victors to uh, regard history as bunk, you know, consign it to the trash can. Who cares? Let's look ahead. It's also quite normal for the victims to take history seriously for pretty good reasons. Uh, and they just make a few observations. It's a very important matter. I'll just barely touch it, but it can be useful to think about it a little. Uh, today is actually not the first occasion when uh, Egypt and uh, the United States are in somewhat uh, uh, similar situations. Uh, the, uh, that was er also true in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, economic historians have argued that, in that at that time, say around 1830, uh, Egypt was uh, well placed to undertake rapid economic development about the same time the US was beginning to do so. Uh, both Egypt and the US had uh, rich agriculture. Uh, that included cotton, which is sort of the oil of the 19th century, the fuel of the early Industrial Revolution, uh, though there was a difference. Uh, unlike Egypt, uh, the United States <clears throat> had to develop cotton production uh, and a workforce uh, by conquest, uh, extermination, and slavery, uh, the consequences are still very much alive. Uh, all you have to do is take a look at the reservations for the survivors of the extermination program and also at the prisons that have expanded very rapidly since the uh, Reagan years and far beyond any other country. Uh, and the needed, they're needed to house the superfluous population uh, left over by deindustrialization. There's a pretty close race class correlation, so it ends up being largely black, to some extent Hispanic. Uh, 
Uh, there was, however, one fundamental difference between Egypt and the United States at that time. Uh, the United States had gained independence, and it was therefore free uh, to ignore the prescriptions of economic theory. They were delivered at the time by Adam Smith uh, in terms uh, quite similar to those that are prescribed forced sometimes for the so-called developing societies today. Uh, Smith right away urged the, uh, or at the time of the War of Independence, uh, he urged the liberated colonies to produce primary products for export and to import superior British manufacturers and certainly not to monopolize crucial goods like particularly cotton. Uh, any other path, he said, would retard instead of accelerating the further increase in the value of their annual produce and would obstruct instead of promoting the progress of their country towards real wealth and greatness. Familiar words expressed a little less, less elegantly today, but same, same, same prescriptions. Well, the colonies had gained their independence, and so therefore they were free to ignore the principles of sound economics and they were able to follow England's own course of uh, state-guided uh, independent development. This was, in fact, the case. Uh, and so the colonies right away imposed uh, high, very high tariffs to uh, protect industry from superior British exports, at first textiles, later steel, and others, and a range of other devices to uh, accelerate economic development. Uh, the independent republic uh, also proceeded to try to gain a monopoly of cotton. Uh, that was the uh, primary goal behind the conquest of Texas and conquest of half of Mexico. And the goal was quite explicit. The Jacksonian presidents explained that uh, if the United States could gain a monopoly of cotton, we could place all other nations at our feet. Uh, particularly the British enemy, which was the main impediment to expansion. That's why Canada is still technically free, though becoming slowly incorporated by other means. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, for Egypt, on the other hand, a comparable course was barred by British power. Uh, Lord Palmerston declared that uh, no ideas of fairness towards Egypt ought to stand in the way of such great and paramount interests of Britain as preserving its economic and political hegemony. He also expressed uh, what he called his hate for the ignorant barbarian, Muhammad Ali, modernizing leader, who dared to seek an independent course. And uh, uh, Britain was able to deploy uh, its fleet and its financial power to terminate uh, Egypt's quest for independence and economic development. Uh, it's policies like these, incidentally, that are substantially responsible for the divide that developed between what we call the first and the third world. They were not very different in that period. Uh, after World War II, the United States replaced uh, Britain as global hegemon, and the United States adopted exactly the same stand. Uh, the US made it clear that it would provide no aid to Egypt unless Egypt adhered to the standard rules for the weak, Adam Smith's prescriptions, IMF World Bank prescriptions. Uh, the US, of course, continued to violate them, but that's according to the regular principles as well. So the US uh, imposed high, tariff, high tariffs on Egyptian cotton to protect US cotton production, uh, and it uh, led to a terrible dollar shortage in Egypt. Uh, that's the usual interpretation of market principles going back in centuries. Uh, market principles are kind of like democracy. You appeal to them when they're useful, but disregard them when they're harmful. Uh, so it's uh, not too surprising that uh, to see the campaign of hatred against the United States that concerned Eisenhower uh, over 50 years ago uh, based on the recognition that uh, the United States, like Britain, France, others with the power to do so, uh, the United States supports dictators 
uh, blocks democracy and development, uh, and does so for quite understandable reasons. Uh, in Adam Smith's defense, I should mention that he recognized what would happen to Britain if it adhered to the rules of sound economics. Uh, so there's what's now more or less called neoliberalism. Uh, he warned that if British manufacturers, merchants, and investors turned abroad, they might profit, but England would suffer. However, he felt that uh, they would be guided by uh, what's sometimes called a home bias. They'd prefer the home country. So as if by an invisible hand, England would be spared the ravages of uh, classical, uh, of economic, what's called economic rationality. Actually, that passage in Wealth of Nations is pretty hard to miss. It's the only passage in which the famous phrase invisible hands appears in a critique of what we now call neoliberalism and a warning against it. Uh, the other leading founder of uh, classical economics, David Ricardo, uh, he drew pretty similar conclusions. He explained that he hoped that home bias would, I'm quoting him now, would lead men of property to be satisfied with the low rate of profits in their own country rather than seek a more advantageous employment for their wealth in foreign nations. He's speaking of England, of course, and he said these are feelings that I would be sorry to see weakened. Uh, putting aside their predictions, the instincts of the classical economists were quite sound. Uh, well, going back to coming back to today, the democracy uprisings in the Arab world are uh, pretty commonly compared to Eastern Europe in 1989, uh, but that's a rather dubious comparison. Uh, in 1989, the democracy uprising was supported by Western powers in accord with the standard doctrine that democracy is fine if it uh, satisfies uh, strategic and economic interests. Uh, furthermore, uh, the democracy uprisings were tolerated by the dominant power in the region, by Russia, uh, almost exactly the opposite of what's happening now. There's no Gorbachev in the West, quite the contrary, and Western power remains uh, hostile to democracy in the Arab world uh, for quite sound reasons, those that I mentioned. Uh, so a more relevant comparison, and one which is never drawn, uh, but I think it is more relevant, would be to events that were taking place in US domains at exactly the same time, 1989. So for example, a few days after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, an elite uh, Salvadoran battalion it was fresh from renewed training in the John F. Kennedy 